Jack is the author of, of so many books. I can't begin to name them. I have some of my own favorites. Pa a Path with a Heart is an enduring favorite of mine and one I continue to send out to people. And Jack, uh, of course, was a, a monk trained in Burmese uh, forest tradition and is a singular leader of Vipassana and mindfulness meditation throughout the world. And uh, I am so proud to have you on in a discussion of uh, meditation and psychedelics. I think will be quite free ranging and we'll have a question and answer period at the end uh, at some point. And we have an hour to play with. So Jack, just um, maybe just tell us what's going on with COVID-19 and Spirit Rock. Uh, Spirit Rock, everything's closed. Like Spirit Rock, like mo many many places, is closed, and it's gone online. If you go to spiritrock.org, you can find different online retreats. But for now, and probably for the next year, it will remain closed as a, a retreat center. People love it; they want to go back, but not until it's safe and Allah wills it. <laughs> and I imagine that's a financial burden as it's been to so many uh, nonprofit institutions and trying to keep it alive and keep teachers going and keeping yeah, it uh, yeah. It must be difficult. Yeah, I think it'll survive. There are enough people that love it that it will carry on. Yes, I'm sure of that. I just imagine it's not been particularly easy. So what, No, you know, and I, that's I, mostly hard. Like all these small businesses and nonprofits, it's hard to continue to pay the whole staff. And that's really the big heartbreak. It's people who are furloughed or who lose their jobs because we don't have any money to pay them all. And that's true across the country because things have been so badly handled that we had this huge pandemic. Yes. And uh, of course, part of what we're talking about is just that, the pandemic and the general trauma of the racism that's going on, the global climate debacle, uh, all the suffering. And I imagine, I imagine you're in great demand to help people uh, deal with heartbreak, suffering, loss, uh, and trauma. What's going on with you personally? For the, for the first few months, I was amazingly busy getting calls from all over to work with different groups, huge foundations and the staff of the Biden campaign and the staff of um, places that are doing first responders of hospitals and places around and then doing things for giant corporations where the leadership and the staff were all, you know, very, very anxious and sometimes people quite desperate. And now two things have happened. We have this amazing capacity as human beings to accommodate to almost anything. And people have sort of accommodated to the pandemic um, and they're not so desperate now. They're more leading lives of quiet desperation as the poet would call it. <laughs> um, but there's deep concerns about all the crises we face, the economic crisis, the social justice crisis, the racist crisis, the climate crisis. Um, the moral, we're really in a spiritual crisis as a culture. Um, and so I'm getting calls, but also with Black Lives Matter, where I've been involved in my own way, there are people that want to hear voices from the community of people of color as well. So um, all that going on. And at the same time, there's been a huge surge of interest in people wanting to figure out ways how to steady their hearts, quiet their minds and sort of tend themselves well whilst they are going through all these multiple difficulties. And I, I saw looking uh, at your activities online that there are myriad uh, sources for people to get that kind of instruction. And sure. how there are there are many things and I have on my website jackcornfield.com a bunch of meditations and teachings and so forth, as there are from many of my fine colleagues, Sharon Salzberg and Tara Brock and others. So yeah, yeah. And with, within our framework of this week long infinite ply of the K-Dome Microdome, we, you are part of a wonderful series on meditation and psychedelics uh, 
and um, Bob Thurman's been on. I did an interview with Stephen Batchelor yesterday, Elias Dakwa, uh, myriad people in which we're uh, talking and sharing about meditation practices and psychedelics and people, of course, uh, are, you know, Stephen Batchelor, for example, just wrote a book uh, in which he outed himself really for the first time on yeah. the importance of it. Uh, uh, Solitude is the name of the book. And we were talking about it yesterday and recent experiences even with ayahuasca. And, and I know you've been very open about your uh, uh, influences uh, by psychedelic medicine. And they go back a ways, as I recall. Yeah. So maybe we could talk yeah, so about that a bit. Talk some about psychedelics, especially in these wild times, which, as I said, the culture is as much as anything in a deep spiritual crisis. Um, and one of the profound gifts of psychedelics as a sacred medicine, of course, is that they can open us um, to whole other ways of understanding healing and, and great dimensions. Um, now my own, and so they're really a profound gift um, to our culture and in some way to worldwide humanity. Um, my own experience is because I'm of the certain age that I got to spend time in Haight-Ashbury and go to the, you know, the Fillmore with a little wagon and take my LSD there and various other things like that. Um, but then I took the journey to the East, wanting to learn how to stabilize and learn the, the, the vastness of consciousness that psychedelics showed me. I wanted to understand how do you navigate them? How do you integrate them? And also I knew that there was really deep healing and understanding that I needed. And I thought, are there still great Zen masters and great teachers? And fortunately I found some and spent some years as a Buddhist monk. Um, and when I, you know, and, and I meditated a year, a year, a year and a half in silence on a retreat, just sitting and walking in meditation for 15, 20 hours a day, um, learned all kinds of things, how to go into states of bliss and samadhi, dissolve my body into light, things like that. Of course, when I came back, I got into an intimate relationship with a woman and all the old programming came back. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that, whoa, going up is fine, but how do you come back down and integrate it was really the question. It's like Ramdas taking, you know, 500 acid trips um, in New York, you know, at Millbrook and coming back down and saying, wait, I need something that integrates them, which is part of, at least part of the question that we have to understand. I also realized that um, from the very beginning that the sacred medicine was a way of opening us in quite parallel to the deepest of Buddhist teachings. Um, because Buddhist teachings begin by saying, mind is the forerunner of all things. All things are created out of consciousness. And as a Buddhist teacher um, and practitioner, the goal is to step out of our identity with a small or separate sense of self Sometimes it's called the body of fear, or Alan Watts described it as the skin encapsulated ego, and shift, shift our identity to mystery, to the sense of interconnection with all things, or interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh translates it, to discover that who we are is consciousness itself, is the play of mind, the dream of my, the play of consciousness. And in understanding this shift of identity and a connection with all things, then there comes compassion, ethical behavior, a wisdom of how to navigate human incarnation, knowing that it's part of this greater mystery and love, um, because love is actually what we are. Even in the most prosaic way, when a person is born, that baby is carried in love. Oh, here's a newborn. And when a per at the end of a life, when somebody holds the hand of a person dying, that last gesture is a gesture of love. It's who we are. All in between is a dance, really seeking love or becoming love in some fashion. Our true nature is consciousness and love. That's its 
And I've written about psychedelics in my book, Bringing Home the Dharma, there's a whole chapter, that most of the great um, Western Buddhist teachers and Hindu teachers of my generation, you know, the Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein and probably Pema Chodron and, you know, Tara Brock and um, Ram, Ram Dass. And we all were profoundly influenced by psychedelics. Um, and in my case, I took LSD. I did peyote ceremonies with uh, this great Huichol shaman, Don Jose Rios, who was 102 years old at that time. I'd done, you know, mushrooms and ketamine when it was first something that people were exploring in pretty high doses and toad and all different kinds of things like that. I don't do them much anymore at age 75. My body is not as happy to do these kind of things and they don't feel as, as necessary. Now in the Buddhist tradition, um, the teachings say to refrain from intoxicants, but there is a, um, a translation question because the teaching says, um, depending how you translate it, to refrain from intoxicants or to refrain from those substances which intoxicate the mind. Yeah. Um, and so, sure, I mean, we've got 10 million alcoholics or 20 million alcoholics and 10 million drug addicts in this country and 50 million people in their families and the majority of car fatalities and home fires and child abuse, all that from addiction. So this is speaking to that very serious and real issue that we as human beings have about the capacity for addiction. And while most psychedelics are not addictive, some like ketamine can become addictive, as I've seen in certain, you know, explorers and friends. But we have to understand that the Buddhist teachings about intoxicants are basically, you will not get intoxicant, intoxicated in ways that either lead to destructive behavior for yourself or others that lead to addiction, um, that lead to a lack of understanding or clarity. And that's how I would translate those teachings. Um, and in fact, if you read into ancient India, in the Vedas, um, there's all these descriptions of Soma and the way people were receiving the sacred medicine from the forest and allowing them to transcend. Or if you go to the Ganges River and there are sadhus with their chillums and pretty powerful hashish sitting there smoking in a naked loincloth after doing their morning yoga and prayers and so forth, communing with God. So it's, it's not a foreign substance in the... Interestingly, I would just say that Deepak Chopra, who was on at the beginning of this series with us, described just that, going up to a sadhu who was doing a chillum and asking for some uh, marijuana. And the sadhu said, no, you're not, you're not ready for it. And we, <laughs> we, discussed, we discussed Soma and we came to the conclusion, which I've been harboring forever. And he agreed that Soma is that, it's powerful hashish. That's what was available. It's a great- you know, Maybe, maybe. There, yeah, 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 that's interesting. There are a number of different theories. And that's one of the right. things that's happened for me is when I came back from the monastery, Beside getting involved with Ramdas, who's been a friend for decades, I became very close to Stan Groff, who's still a very dear close friend. And I remember um, going down to Johns Hopkins Spring Grove, where he was doing the last legitimate LSD research um, in 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 the world, as far as I know, certainly in the U.S. And he showed me some videotapes of sessions on that one inch wide tape, reel to reel, black and white early. And I remember a session, for example, of a man named Jesse, who was uh, a coal miner from Virginia in his 60s and emaciated from cancer and terrified and shaking in fear and coming close to death. And they gave him a pretty high dose of LSD, which was being used for near death patients and for, um, other, other protocols of depression, things like that. Um, and it was, this video was cut in pieces so I could see Jesse beginning with the 
earphones and eye shades. And then, you know, his going, his body contorting, he had been in tremendous pain and tremendous fear. And you could see him going through all that in the process of his trip. And then the eye shades came out and they talked to him. And he said in his, you know, West Virginia accent, I've never seen nothing like this. And then you see his face and it's turned from being all contorted and full of pain. He said, I don't have no pain anymore. He said, in fact, I, I'm not afraid of nothing because I, I hate to tell, I don't know how to tell you, but I seen God and I know it's all going to be. And you see this human being who was so profoundly contracted in the body of fear, having opened up to the dimension of consciousness that is truly who we are which is love and spirit and consciousness itself. And I said, this is, you know, this is the Western medicine or part of it. But what I also discovered and why Stan and I worked together for 50 years is that people do need tools to integrate and make it actually a, a full part of life. So in many of the sessions we would lead, whether people on the side were taking the substances or doing that deep holotropic breath work, we would complement that with meditation trainings to learn how to navigate all these different realms. Um, and still, as our dear friend Angelus Arian said, walking the mystical path with practical feet, with a, yeah. with a respect for our human incarnation. Stan, so I, that diagram of the two circles intersecting of the uh, consciousness circle, the psychedelic circle and the being here circle and the intersection is the precious space in which we wish to travel in a way that is wisdom traveling as much as that's possible heart traveling and so the experience both with psychedelics and deep meditation for me is that on the most profound level uh, what we are, what the universe is, is consciousness itself. Pure, you know, the Tibetan writing about the pure unalloyed state of consciousness, the teachers I had in the forest talk about the unborn, um, uh, uh, consciousness as the nameless unformed. And it's possible both in deep psychedelic journeys and in deep meditation to experience the dimension of consciousness before it turns into all the manifested form. And then people have all these wild and wonderful experiences in their spiritual practice or in psychedelics. And I'm not even talking about the content yet, but, but that pure radiant consciousness like a crystal um, if you shine light through a crystal, you get blue and, you know, purple and yellow and red and green. The same thing is true of consciousness, that at times the luminosity of consciousness, depending how you experience it, becomes pure love or pure emptiness or fullness. It becomes perfect peace or it becomes a sense of, the perfection of the universe, or it becomes a sense of, um, of illuminated compassion that all existence, you know, is the field of love and compassion together, um, you know, or it becomes a sense of light itself, that everything is actually made of light, all of which are true. Now, what happens in the spiritual world and somewhat in the psychedelic world is people will um, attach to one or another dimensions and say, it's really all love. No, it's really about emptiness, that everything is empty and like a dream, you know, it's all dreamlike. And somebody else will say, no, 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 it's nature is pure. And then someone else will say, yes, but suffering is built into duality. And that's it. And it's like saying blue or green is better than red or yellow. They're different dimensions of consciousness. And when we see that, then we can see the play of consciousness and the Buddhist texts like the Avatamsaka Sutra, which describes tens of thousands of millions of eons of years created out of consciousness and all the universes made out of 
fire and water and beings of every kind and the awakening in all those universes. Um, and underneath them all is the understanding that this is the, the ultimate creative principle itself, playing with itself. Now, um, I could teach a meditation now, I don't know what our time is like, for the fun of it and give people a little taste of meditation in relation to the psychedelics and then kind of go on to talk about how the two uh, complement each other if you think that would be a good thing. I would love it. Please uh, let us accept your gift. Okay. So for those who are listening, uh, I would like to suggest that as you listen, you close your eyes. But even before you do, um, if there's any sounds around you, um, good. And if possible, um, open the window where you are so you can hear the traffic or the birds or whatever is there. Um, this is a meditation that actually is going to use the ambient sound of experience um, and invite you to shift from the small separate sense of self to something larger. So sit quite comfortably and let your body be still. Allow your eyes to close gently. Take a few deep breaths. Let the eyes and face be soft and loosen the jaw. Let the shoulders relax and the arms and hands rest easily. And the body rest halfway between heaven and earth, just as you sit quietly. Now for this meditation, let yourself shift your attention to the doorway of the ear with your eyes closed gently, instead of focusing on your breath or a mantra or a body sensation or an image, begin to listen. And as you listen, you will hear these words appearing and vanishing. And you will hear the space and silence between these words. And if you listen more carefully, You'll hear ambient sounds in the room where you are, soft whispers, distant sounds, maybe autos or airplanes or the wind rustling. And you are simply awareness of sound. And the sounds appear and disappear like waves of the ocean. You'll also hear the sound of these bells. You hear this bell and these
And as you listen, let yourself sense or feel or imagine any way you can that your mind is not limited to the size of your head. Let yourself feel or imagine or sense that your mind is vast like space or the sky without boundaries and that all the sounds that you hear the bells, the distant sounds, the soft sounds around you, and the silence in between. They appear and disappear in the vast sky of your own mind. Your mind is like vast space, open and transparent and timeless. And the sounds that you hear are like clouds appearing in space and disappearing, vanishing, leaving no trace. And in the vastness of this space of mind, just as sounds come and go, notice how thoughts and images will also arise. Picture thoughts and word thoughts appear and disappear. They display themselves like clouds or waves. An image, a picture, a thought, a sentence. And then they dissolve, leaving no trace. Relaxed into the vastness, it is your true nature, it is who you really are. Thoughts appear like clouds and vanish, dissolving into silence. Words and images arise and pass. Emotions like storms appear, sadness and joy in the space, and after a time dissolve. And even the body, if you feel carefully, it floats in the space of mind, not as a solid body, but as a field of energy of tingling and vibration, warmth and cool, pleasure and pain, breathing, moving, ever-changing field, floating quietly in the vast space of mind. No inside, no outside. Who you are, is pure consciousness itself. Let go and relax into the vastness. And notice that this vast spacious consciousness contains all things, yet is not limited by them. open, transparent,
timeless. And allow yourself to sense it being filled with love. For love is who you are. Love is the connection. The consciousness itself is a form of love. that fills and informs all things. Who you are is loving awareness. Relax into it. Trust it. It is your home. And when you're ready and you hear the sound of the bells, remaining in the vast sense of loving awareness as your true nature, with the sound of the bell in your own time, let your eyes open and see the colors and forms of life that appear to you in the vast openness and remain in the identity of loving awareness that is who you really are, even as you play in the realm of form. And so this meditation is one of a hundred kinds that help us to step out of the sense of separateness of the small sense of self. For some, it may work better than others. The one thing you don't want to do is use the meditation to judge yourself. You're already too good at that. You don't need any further instruction. Instead, if it served you, you can play with it. And if not, there's meditations on compassion or light or breath practices. There are many others for you to do. But this is really a practice that invites us to begin to explore the mystery of consciousness that we are, in fact, loving awareness itself, born into these bodies, becoming this human incarnation. But what's prior to consciousness? is mystery, and we are that mystery expressing itself. As my dear friend Ramdas used to say, remember your true nature and your social security number. So you have to both be open to the vastness, and then as your eyes return to the form of incarnation, to let yourself embody this loving awareness with all that you see and all that you touch. And this is why meditation becomes so helpful because through the practice of meditation, you learn how to witness all the different states that arise. If you take acid or psilocybin or various other sacred substances and they open you to love and immensity and so forth in the way of an opening and then returning, you may very well go through a death rebirth experience. You may do deep healing in your ayahuasca journey or in some lower dose ketamine experiences, all these kinds of things. With meditation training, you learn how to become the loving witness of it all without being afraid of the fear, without being afraid of letting go into the next experience letting it open and navigating it easily and then more importantly as you return and come back it gives you a daily and regular way 
to stay connected with this sense of vastness and sacredness while you're seated on the earth and to embody it in your relationships to others or the way that you move through the world. You become the witness, but you become the, the skillful and loving witness that can be present for life and at the same time know that the social constructs that are around you are all created forms and you know who you really are, who we really are is so much vaster than that. So I'll stop with this and see what kind of questions or things you want to ask Phil or others. I, I think uh, with great gratitude, I would just open up uh, our door to others to come in. So let me just put the um, the sharing of the link up and people can copy the link and come in. And that is uh, what you need to hit to come into our uh, Conference Cornfield, our meditative experience with Jack Cornfield. So we'll leave that up for a little bit and see who comes on. So I, Jack, you were kind enough to write a blurb to the ketamine papers for doing a new ketamine paper, but a uh, book. But the um, one part of what you spoke to is, is such uh, profoundly available with the ketamine experience, not in super high doses, but in doses that lead to ego dissolution and that they open the mind to extraordinary new realities that are total and in the moment of experience. And in those realities, people are truly freed from the constraints and the obsessions and the longings, the cravings, the poisons of everyday life. And there's a freedom to travel and be in a liberated zone, which is instructive. It really, when one comes down, and incorporates it and has helped with an integration, it really benefits the experience of meditation itself, which I think is a fusion. I think you can't live in the psychedelic space fully without living in this world space. And what we bring back, what we do to enhance our lives from the psychedelic space is the critical issue for us. And so that letting go enables a new kind of construction of self, much as each journey of meditation, like the one we just did with you, that you offered, offers us a new potential for construction of our awareness, of our consciousness, of our freedom from our structures that are conceptual. Yeah, I mean, what you just described is, a, is eloquent um, and a beautiful description of the way that we can both open and then come back and embody or integrate those understandings and those insights. We step out of the skin of our identity, the conditioning, the fears, the self views and the views of others, the traumas that we have. And there's a freedom in that to realize that who we are is love itself, who we are is vastness. And then in returning, it's not that those don't present themselves, because as you point out, they do. I'm back. Um, the question is that as we return, can we embody that love? Can we become that love, including for our neurosis, including for our, you know, skin encapsulated ego, including for the nutty things that we have done or people around us, that in some way we become love more than we become somebody. And that's, I think, how meditation really serves as well. It gives a foundation or a grounding to be present and to be loving, even in the most daily, simple regimen of practice and training. I think that's beautifully said, because I think that my own experience and what we're trying to help others experience is the arising of compassion, tolerance, respect, uh, reduction of judgment and reactivity so that we can coexist and co-create and we can deal with such difficult 
uh, situations as have arisen unprecedentedly. Uh, I'm sure in your life, I'm a year older than you, uh, that you know I have never faced in my lifetime the abomination of what's happening. You know, we were under the desks in New York uh, trying to avoid nuclear attack as if the desk was going to protect us. And, yeah. you know, we never got a Soviet bear bomber uh, coming over us. But here we are in this terrible multiple uh, attack on the quality of life, survival, people's being, consciousness, selfishness, we just survival itself is at stake for so many people and great, great mourning. It is such a great mourning. Our next uh, experience on this program is a, a, a presentation of uh, sharing of remembrance of those we've lost. Uh, and today is uh, my son Noah's 39th birthday, but he hasn't been around for 30 wow. years. You know, for now, uh, 22 of those 39 years. So, yes. We should have compassion in lives. Do we have any questions? Uh, is there anyone on who would like to raise a question? Julian, can you help us to see if there's anyone here? Uh, if anybody has a question, just do, uh, we can. Um... There's a hand raising mechanism. I'll just unmute. I don't see anyone on. Okay, there we go. Here comes a question. Here comes a question. Hello. Hi. Hi, welcome. Hey. Thank you. Um, thank you for the meditation. It was really, really great. Um, I wanted to ask about I'm very involved in the, in the education of psychedelics in, in Mexico City and in Mexico. And uh, I, have, I have something that kind of, I don't know what to, to do with. <laughs> I'm, I've been on my spiritual path for a while. And I, now I come to realize that, I mean, it's very trendy to have, have psychedelics here and in many places. And I wonder, and a lot of people want to be on that spiritual path too, once they take them or they are on it and then they take the psychedelics. And I wanted to ask you about, I don't know, if in other traditions or what you think about when people have this very revealing experience or mystical experiences and they were not seeking it. So... It's almost like in the meditation path, maybe there's like an integration and a looking for something. And then it suddenly comes that you you have this mystical experience, but when you're not seeking it, I see that, um, well, there's a big, big space uh, when you weren't even seeking and then you have every, like so much knowledge and you've seen so much light. And then there's that huge gap. So what would you recommend that people, um, can do with that gap? How can they navigate, navigate that space between like first being completely shut off from maybe the light or the truth and then coming full contact with it and integrating those? It's a beautiful question and a profound one. Um, yes, you're right. If someone has chosen a spiritual path and has that impulse, then um, if they open to a sense of mystery and mystical and beyond their selves, at least they have a context for it. But I think of various friends like Christina Groff, who was married to Stan Groff for all these years and doing work in this field. Her first experience happened in childbirth, where she was giving birth to a child. And then in the middle of that, had this full-blown kundalini experience throughout her body and lights and opening to cosmic, uh, you know, uh, understanding. And as she tried to talk about it to the doctors, they just gave her, you know, Valium or something to quiet her down because there was nothing in their medical training that helped them understand what a miracle uh, that was and what a mystical experience actually could be. And that's just an example 
of course, you say it can come from psychedelics, but it can come in other ways too. It can come from a near-death experience as another kind of example. And then- I, I would just add that I'm also talking, as I heard you, if I heard you correctly, about the mid-region when something occurs untowardly uh, or unexpectedly, when, you know, there are many people who've been, have it, who've had first psychedelic experiences where someone tripped them without telling them about that. And there is uh, that unpreparedness for experiences that are so powerful and unnerving when the set and setting of human beings isn't consciously attended to. So that's when it can really hurt. And still one makes wonderful things out of it, but sometimes it really leaves people staggering and lost for quite long periods of time. And that's kind, of, that's kind of what St. John of the Cross writes about in Dark Night of the Soul, of having this open being so confused and not knowing how to get back or where it was or why or something. And so for those people, I think the two things that are most helpful is to normalize it, to say actually people have been experiencing this for thousands of years in meditation with sacred substances and so forth. And you just had the doors open, whether it was by accident or not, hallelujah. Um, and yes, it's disorienting and it's supposed to be because it shows you something bigger um, than your normal sense of self. The second thing beside normalizing it is to say, there are traditions and practices that will help you integrate it and understand it. And it can be the Christian mystical practices or Buddhist or Hindu or, or other ways, the shamanic path that hold people and say, all right, here's how you hold this. And you, you have to find one that fits your temperament and then use that um, system in some way to support your continued journey. Uh, does this answer your question? No, it does. It's, yeah, it does. Uh, the dark night of the soul, I think it's the, uh, that's what I was thinking about, like feeling that you've been shot off from paradise, like you saw something and then there's like no way back into it. Even when you've been in a period of, of intense meditation and you got to a certain point and then it's like that door closes for you. And I think I have me, myself, and I think two other people that I know have had to go through this, uh, yeah, reading, reading on understanding so, how so other people. You when you went through it, what helped you? What did you do? It was, it was that remem just staying in contact with knowing, remember that even though right now I can't feel that oneness, it was there and I touched it and I have to be very, very patient because even if that was the only time in my lifetime that was enough to know it and try to act from there, and then reading a lot of Christian mysticism that really helped me a lot and understanding that it's something, and like Rand does too, right? It's like, sometimes it's here and then it, it goes away. I don't know what word he says, but it's like, oh, now I'm here. Oh, now it's gone. Oh, now it's a light. Oh, now it's dark. And so eventually I, I felt it coming back up. And every time that I feel coming back up, I just, enjoy it as much as the going away because also when you're feeling that darkness you know that there's something building up that eventually might bring you back into light so it's just like learning to deal with those dualities i think yeah. you've done you've done it beautifully it sounds like and part of it is people need to learn that they get attached to the pleasure and then they get you know very judgmental when it's gone and that locks it in it makes it worse but as you say if you can love the cycle, if you can love when you're open and you also can love when it's closed and say, oh, I love the darkness, I love, if you can bring love to all of it, then you're free. So that's beautiful, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? There was someone else on, I think they've left. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Jack, maybe uh, you want to leave us with some last wonderful words? I, I don't know that you could do better than what you've done already because they've been so wonderful, but 
why not take another stab at it? Meditation well, and psychedelics. Thank, thank you. I'm really grateful. Um, I'm grateful to the sacred medicines I've taken. They've really opened me in ways that have changed my life as deeply as the meditations. Um, and I've really devoted, you know, 50 years to the meditation. So I find them to be a profound compliment. And, and all of them, like for those of you listening, are an invitation to open beyond separateness to love. And then the real dance is, can I, can I then embody that love when high and low, open and closed? Because the truth is that everything breathes, you know, the body breathes and things move in cycle and the heart pumps and so forth. But it turns out the heart opens and closes and sometimes you're just like, oh, I love everything. And sometimes the heart closes. And the idea isn't that it's supposed to stay open all the time. It's just gonna open up, never gonna let like, close. It opens and closes like the sun and the moon. It has its cycles. And the, the, the freedom comes in knowing that you can love the dance of human life, of both uh, the beauty and the pain of it, the perfection and the imperfection, which are actually just two sides of the same thing. And meditation then, depending what kind you do, is a way to quiet your mind, to listen to your body and heart and all that you experience, and for the healing part, to hold it with compassion and love and realize that who you are is so much bigger than just the conditioned experience of your family or your culture, that who you are is love itself, is loving awareness. And establishing and grounding in that, then you can say, oh, this too. This too is part of the dance. Many people struggle, especially you be mind, with the lack of pleasure of meditation, right? You sit in the cushion, the monkey mind's jumping all around. I can't do it. I'll never get control of my mind. This is a lot of experiences therapists have. And yet, here you are 50 plus years and you've been doing meditation. For you, Jeff, tell us, what is the pleasure of this? I hear, hear the discovery of compassion and the return to it and insight. Tell us about the, the pleasure that makes this sought after. Well, first of all, it's not meant to be a grim duty. If you, you know, do your meditation just the way you might be dieting and exercising and, you know, trying to make, or going to your therapy and trying to make yourself better, um, you won't want to do it. But if instead you take the meditation and you do it as an act of love and you say, I'm going to sit and meditate, whatever it is you do, your mantra or sense your breath or bring in this field of mindful loving awareness, which is my practice. I bring mindful loving awareness to my body and I feel where it's pained or contracted or tight. And I let it be pained. I hold it with love and I say, all right, show me. And instead of trying to get rid of the tension or the tightness, I say, open, let me feel you more fully. And the tightness gets more tight and the body wants to move just like on a session of psychedelics and things open. And as I allow it space, as we did in that meditation, it opens and it comes to a place of well-being. And then I feel in this pandemic time, if I tune into my heart, oh, you know, there's grief and sadness, there's worry and fear for what's happening in our culture and around the world. There's um, anger, all those things along with underneath them, I'm angry because I care. Underneath the fear, I'm afraid because I care. So I can feel the care and the love and all those things. And I feel it and I sense my heart and I say, thank you. Thank you for being big enough to hold all these feelings. I'm okay for now, I'm the loving awareness and I can be aware of you and appreciate all that you're holding, thank you. And then I see the monkey mind and I don't try to stop it. I say, oh yeah, you're thinking a lot. You're concerned, you're remembering, you're worrying. I bow to it. I say, thank you for trying to protect me. Thank you for doing your job, but I'm okay. So I don't really need to follow your thoughts so much. I'll thank you. I'm just going to sit in love for a while. And in this way, the meditation isn't something that where I'm fighting against myself or trying to stop my thoughts or not have sad feelings or 
get rid of the tension, I become the field of love itself that allows the play of body and mind. Things then gradually settle, not all the time. Um, and I, I come out of it feeling like, oh, this is who we are. This is who we are. We are love. On that note, I'll express my deep gratitude for you, for you being part of the K-Dome, the Microdome, and the Infinite Via. And see you soon, and may you be healthy, and may your great good work continue unabated. Thank you. And the same to you, Phil, and to everybody who's been part of this. And virtual Burning Man, you know, may it spread across the world and bring joy and awakening to everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye.